uh, and the fact that so much of this is corroborated by evidence of photographs that Israeli soldiers themselves have been posting to social media seeming to brag about rifling through the drawers of women, throw, uh, holding up uh, undergarments um, and the like, it, it's, it's not a, it's, it's, it's the optics of this are, are pretty, are pretty bad. Wow. The optics are bad. You want to see what's going on with that Marine story that was breaking? He passed away and I have some updates here. Uh, first off, here are the headlines of, you know, the Marine who set himself on fire in front of the Israeli Air embassy. Force. Uh, I'm sorry, Air Force. Thank you for the correction. I think one of these had a, a incorrect headline. So thank you for that live. We're doing it live. Uh, correction. So uh, the question is, why did he do it? Because none of the headlines will tell you that he said free Palestine. Right. So that's a problem. And then there's a. There's Miko Paled's sister who posted that. That's probably part of why he did that thing. He was looking for, here's his LinkedIn. And aspiring software engineer with educational work experience in the software development Linux system administration. That's sad. And there's a video of him right before he passed away. And yeah, that's ongoing story that I was looking into while we were going through those clips. And um, the New York Times has not done any favors to their good friend Israel by making such hyperbolized claims without evidence. They thought they were doing it for the good of the narrative. And there's been a lot of posts on it in the past 48 hours because that story has been much relied upon to cover for the genocide, ethnic cleansing, all the dead women and children. Uh, it was okay because Hamas did systematic gang, gang rapes. But even in Ogle's statement where he says that babies were raped, that's a very extreme claim. And it puts pictures in people's heads. And if there's no evidence of that in reality, you're doing a disservice to everyone who died on 10-7. And even then, I must state, we've already went over this so many times, but even if these claims were true, even if they were right. true, they... Again, this would be Hamas terrorists that are guilty, not the Palestinian people, of which over the half the pop 60 percent of the population is women and children. So at some point, the proportion, obviously, we talked about proportionality. In fact, I was looking up Augustine's Christian sort of rules for war from way back in the day. And it's interesting because they recognize proportionality even back then, thousands of years ago. Not that it was ever followed in any capacity, but that is, it's, it's an interesting sort of anecdote. Um, so proportionality isn't like a new modern concept when it comes to warfare, apparently, from my understanding. Uh, so that was one interesting little anecdote. Another is the fact that uh, we already went over this, but in Afghanistan and Iraq, it was a uh, a tragic, for many reasons, a tragic situation that turned the population largely against us. And again, you know, it was actually, uh, what's his name? Sagar and Jetty's friend, Jocko Willink, that, you know, um, headed up or spearheaded a new way to uh, deal with counterinsurgency so and counterterrorism. And so it was uh, difficult because it was a long, drawn-out process of having to gain the trust of, God, man, it reminds me of the third season of The Wire. Just gain the trust of people in the local community. You're not the ones there to kill them. We're going to stop bombing you. We're going to like work with you and say, hey, you know. And that was, only, you know, those, those were very successful. They also took years and lots of money. It sounds like Israel doesn't want that. Israel really doesn't want. See, if we actually go back to what Ben-Gurion said, and many of the founding fathers of so-called the, the state of Israel and Zionism, unfortunately, they wanted to completely remove the Palestinian people for the past 75 plus years. So the true, the true and stated goal, including by uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu himself, which we played many times, and obviously the IDF forces and the head of the IDF and all these various war hawks in his council, they want the complete removal of these people, whether it's just them leaving, forcibly leaving, you know, ethnic cleansing, or through genocide, they don't care. That's they also why they're not the appealing removal. to like a Jocko Willink style. You know, we're going to go after just Hamas. No, Hamas was the straw men they built up on purpose to go after the innocent people and then utilize these uh, Hasbaric, fallacious appeal to emotion, appeal to all sorts of grotesque atrocity that is emotion again that's way embellished and hyperbolized beyond all sorts of any sort of recognition. Like 
real recognition of reality that is they not only want to get rid of the palestinians they want to get rid of anyone who supports human rights for palestinians oh good point oh that's because a good point. yeah good i'm point. not saying this right. is a real mossad post i'm saying this is a real twitter post and allegedly this account posted this thing and deleted it shortly thereafter this is jake shields he's a jujitsu type uh five-time world champion so if you have a problem with this post he's the one that posted it i happen to think that is something that they would post given something given the things we've seen from the idf's account in recent weeks i have not had time to dig into this because this is a live investigation into the death of this air force soldier who lit himself on fire to protest israel in front of the israeli embassy I'm sure the youtube algorithm was will love that when i upload this clip <laughs> See if you can decipher that AI. Maybe you'll get a correct view on the situation. I don't know. Uh, there's what do they call? What do they call it when we went into Iraq? Operation Iraqi Freedom or some nonsense like that? Sure. Like some yeah, you know, some obnoxious. I mean, they whatever. <laughs> everything's so inverted. I mean, just Christ. So we're gonna look a little bit further into this rape controversy because all of these claims, it's not like they're just made over here in a vacuum. They're used as justification by the prime minister of Israel last week in his speech to the English speaking world. He used these claims and then you're going to hear them on Piers Morgan to defame Norman Finkelstein. You're going to hear Mr. Schmully and he's going to say some egregious hyperbolized evangelizing type in his white outfit. It was too bright. They, they needed to turn down the, the gain on that man. He was bright. He's bright over there. And then uh, it was also repeat, repeated by Congressman Ogles, Ogles, not just in the hallway, but he doubled down the next day in that press release that we looked at a little bit ago, because that also repeats the Hasbara that is being used to kill the women and children over there in that place where they take away the hospitals and the food and the diapers and all that stuff. That is a living hell for those people, and that's called collective punishment, and thou shalt not use my tax dollars for such activities without me using my First Amendment while I have it. So let's go to these clips. We're going to see clips from Katie Halper. Uh, there's one from Al Jazeera. There's one from the Minority Report and one from Middle East Eye uh, as well. We'll be right back. So speaking of violence, um, something that has been getting a lot of attention, both from the U.S. media and the politicians in the United States is, of course, the allegations of uh, sexual violence as a weapon of war allegedly used by Hamas on October 7th. In fact, we actually had Hillary Clinton at an event at uh, Columbia University at the School of International and Public Affairs called Preventing and Addressing Conflict-Related Sexual Violence. And one of the speakers at this event was actually the lead author of this major New York Times story called Screams Without Words, which was published in December, which claimed to report on how Hamas used rape as a mass weapon on October 7th. Now, the reporting was terrible. It misrepresented the main character, the main subject who was allegedly raped. Her parents didn't think she had been raped. Her parents said that the reporter had misrepresented the story. They quoted people whose stories changed. I these are not people who accuse, I'm, I'm talking about witnesses. It was so shoddily done that the New York Times decided to shelve a podcast they were going to do on it on the daily. They were going to do a, a story on this story. But here's Hillary Clinton talking about what happened when she was so rudely interrupted by protesters. Use of sexual violence in conflict uh, was especially uh, horrendous. Uh, I teach now at Columbia at the School of International and Public Affairs, and uh, we had an event. We had two events last week. We had three panels about Ukraine, and they were superb. They went off without a hitch. Uh, we learned a lot and were challenged. Two days later, we had panels on uh, conflict-related sexual violence. It included Ukraine, Sudan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Israel. And it was protested. 
you just have to ask yourself how you could have an event focused on using rape as a tactic of war against women and girls, which is in conflict across the world, and you include the most recent horrendous example out of Israel, and that brings out the protesters. So there is a, an invidious strain of anti-Semitism that has never gone away, but we had hopes it had been uh, certainly submerged, that has been uh, poking its head up uh, for quite some time now. Okay, so first of all, Hillary Clinton's husband and political partner, more women have accused him of rape than have accused Hamas of rape. I have to make that point. The point must be made. Uh, it's kind of obscene that she's up there talking about violence against women and girls when she was such a hawk and oversaw so much war. And as she knows, because she loves saying that women's rights are human rights, as she knows, women and girls are disproportionately harmed in war. She also weaponized, talk about weaponizing rape. She helped spread the rumor about Gaddafi giving Viagra to his forces so they would go and rape people. And of course, she helped overthrow Gaddafi, who himself, if you want to talk about weaponizing sexual violence, was sodomized to death in an overthrow supported by the United States and NATO, and now they're open-air slave markets in Libya. So she's the last person who should be talking about any of this. Uh, and I, I think it's disgusting. And I think it's disgusting that this New York Times reporter felt comfortable. But it kind of speaks to how much the media and the political elites protect each other. Well, I, if, <clears throat> during that same event, Gittleman, the New York Times reporter, said something to the effect of after because all this criticism came out even from his own in, in newsroom i mean you saw the intercept report right. that you cited that, that where they they refused to publish the podcast uh, based on the based on the story because of because the, the evidence was shoddy and and did you hear how he gittleman defended himself on that panel he said something to the effect of my role as a journalist is not to analyze the evidence i, I don't want to give you the word evidence Evidence is almost like a legal term that suggests you're trying to, to prove an allegation or prove a case in court. That's, that's not my role. Actually, I think Amira Haas put it the best when she said the role of a journalist is to monitor the centers of power. That's the role of the journalist. Because the centers of power um, can do things behind closed doors and they have the right to use the uh, force. They have a monopoly on the use of force. Those are the people that need to be monitored. OK, if, if the role of a journalist is not to analyze evidence and try and understand what's true and what's false, then I don't know what the role of a journalist is. Apparently, um, you know, you're not supposed to assess whether or not your sources have repeated, uh, uh, have changed their version of the story three times. Right. That, you know, what, one of the lead witnesses in the Gittleman story was what is Roz uh, Cohen, this Israeli who went on October 7th published videos of himself kind of having a good time at the festival hiding in a ditch um he had yeah. two inter he had two interviews on october 8th or no sorry two interviews on october 9th okay no mention of rape on october right. 9th there were no there, he never saw any rape one would expect that the, the, the interview the, the day after right his memories would be fresh he right. just witnessed mass rape you think it would have gotten you think it would have come up no mention on october 10th all of a sudden in his third public interview uh, he saw, quote, many women raped. And then he changes his story again on December 19th. Now he just saw one woman raped. And then the New York Times article, which comes out on December 28th, of course, fails to mention that the guy changed his story four times and just reports the fact that he witnessed mass rape. I mean, the journalistic, uh, um, <clears throat> I, I, don't know what, I don't know what the right word is, but you're, you're, you're publishing a blockbuster story about an ongoing genocide. And, and these mass rape allegations are being used and, ex and exploited to, for, for, to make it easier for that country to continue to kill innocent Palestinian kids. Yeah. And you don't even have the, the, the journalistic integrity to mention that your sources are changing their stories four times?